This conference will now be recorded. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the ACRM Early Career Networking Group Career Development Corner webinar series. I'm Allison Kogan, the ECNG chair. Um, I am thrilled today to present um, our speakers for this webinar entitled Dissemination in Action, Communicating Research in a Digital World. Um, we welcome Karen Goodsman of Northwestern University and Patty Smith of Altmetric. And they're gonna take us through um, a, a great overview of dissemination strategies. And um, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please enter them in the chat box. And also please do mute your microphone um, during the talk. Uh, so without further delay, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen Gutzman. All right, great, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna ask really quickly if, um, if you guys can see my slides. Is that? Yeah, I can, I can see them, yep. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm Karen Goodsman. Um, I'm the Head of Research Assessment and Communications at Galter Health Sciences Library and Learning Center at Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University. And I'm gonna touch today on topics of uh, dissemination and tracking impact in the digital age. Um, this presentation, uh, or my portion of it, will be really focused on dissemination, um, but we will touch on impact at the very end. So to get us started, I thought I would uh, provide a couple definitions. Um, dissemination is making research discoverable and accessible to various audiences, whereas impact is demonstrating the outcomes of research in academia, society, and beyond. And so as I said earlier today, this presentation will focus a lot on dissemination, but um, I will touch a little bit on um, impact um, in academia. And um, I promise you that uh, Patty Smith, who's going, who's going after me, um, will spend a lot of time really talking about that impact in society and beyond in those other spheres. So um, I wanted to start off with just uh, a little overview of the history of um, dissemination. And um, we can trace you know, this all the way back to uh, uh, 1665, where we see kind of the formalization of research um, being shared in a journal form. So we have the first maybe recognized journal um, called the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, where we moved away from just researchers writing letters to each other about their research, but actually formalize, formalizing it into a journal. Um, and we see publishing kind of continuing on in that same vein, um, new journals coming online, Nature and, and uh, Publishing House Elsevier. Um, and our first big disruptor in this field of dissemination and getting research out there is really the World Wide Web in 1990. Um, Archive.org coming online in uh, 1991. This is a preprint server where uh, people can put their work up prior to it being accepted by a journal for publication, prior to it even being peer reviewed. They can just get their work up there right away. Um, Archive.org is uh, still going strong today um, and we'll, we'll mention preprint servers a, a little bit later on. Um, we can also see that there are kind of more informal means of communicating research or disseminating research um, through uh, tools like Blogger coming online in 1999, um, Wikipedia in 2001. Um, we also think, see things like Facebook and Twitter um, in the early 2000s. But one of the kind of biggest moments um, in that time frame is the open access movement, um, which began really in 2002. Um, this idea that research can be made openly available and accessible to people um, online, whoever wants to read it. And we see that being a big influence, um, especially coming along up to 2008, where the NIH public access policy comes into play. Um, so this is the idea that if your research is funded by the National Institutes of Health, um, that your research then has to be made publicly available within 12 months of publication in their um, open access database called PubMed Central. Uh, and, uh, and then we see some other kind of movement um, in this dissemination area. Um, in 2010, uh, we see the Altmetric Manifesto being written, um, and we have companies like Altmetric and Plum Analytics and others that really are trying to identify how research is being disseminated um, online um, and across different uh, spheres. So not just maybe in academia, but in other ways as well. Um, and we see continue to see innovations in publishing um, 
um, through things like F1000 Research and PeerJ, just this idea of open uh, peer review and different forms of, of, of publishing, different publishing models. Um, and so uh, this area continues to evolve, uh, but it's a, it's a great reminder of kind of where we've come from and, and how dissemination has worked um, over the uh, years. So now we're going to talk about all things dissemination, kind of a high level overview. Um, so here's where my, my general reminder that there are a lot of dissemination channels that you can think about um, when you're thinking about how to disseminate your research. Generally, we seem to focus in academia um, on those on the right, journal publishing and book publishing. Uh, but there's a lot else out there. Um, when you go, when you're doing networking, when you're um, leading workshops or trainings, you can be talking about your research. When you go to meetings or presenting at conferences, giving presentations at maybe um, the place that you work or your um, your uh, uh, institution, um, giving community lectures about the work that you do or the research that you do. Also, there are channels like websites, mailing lists, virtual events, social media, news media, press releases. These are all ways in which we can disseminate um, our work and our research to various audiences. Also, I want us to keep in mind that there are lots of outputs that we create in the process of our work um, that can be disseminated. Uh, so again, in academia, we really tend to focus on those articles and those books, but there's so much more. And uh, there's case reports, technical reports, figures, images, infographics, audio files, patient education handouts, teaching materials, data sets, guidelines, user guides, so much more um, that we can think about uh, disseminating um, through those various channels. So kind of keep that wide variety of options in mind because I'm sure that in your work, um, you have created things that others will find useful. Um, working in a library, that's something that we get a lot of requests of, you know, has anyone created a patient education handout on this topic that, that someone can build on or use in their practice? Uh, figures and images and all of that um, are things that uh, we get requests for. And so we know that these are things that, that people want to find um, and want access to. So why dissemination? Um, well, uh, we're concerned about it because we know researchers and organizations are increasingly asked to demonstrate the relevance of their research and their contribution to society. Um, I put three examples here of where dissemination has kind of come, in, come into play for various organizations. So the first one is the National Institutes of Health. This is a request for a proposal for a coordinating center. Um, and this uh, is a, a request that whoever applies to this um, really should address their plans for collection and dissemination of useful, useful products of the research. Um, we see the next uh, example is through the NSF, um, their policies and procedures. They're actually really focused on the peer-reviewed publications, but um, they do expect um, investigators to promptly prepare and submit for publication the significant findings of their work conducted under the NSF grant. And then the last example here is the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Um, in their grant application guidelines, they actually have a section called dissemination. Um, um, and they ask in, uh, investigators to talk about what channels that will be used to disseminate grant products to target audiences. So we know that these questions are being asked. We know that people are having to think about this. Um, and so I don't want to overwhelm you and think that, you know, you need to have some really big grand plan. Of course, there are lots of really great templates out there if you're working with a, a large research group or a center or institute. Um, if you need to find dissemination plans that are very formal, um, you can find them. The CDC has some great ones. Um, there's just a lot out there. Um, but if you're just an individual researcher and thinking about how to disseminate your own work, uh, a simple checklist will do. So here's an example of a researcher's checklist of things to do when a paper comes out. This is a very informal, simple dissemination plan that I think anyone can uh, easily do. So um, this researcher is publishing a paper and they say that they're going to do a couple things. They're going to write a blog post about it. They're going to update their online publication list, um, update their institutional repository, update their ORCID, their LinkedIn, um, check out the Wikipedia page on the topic and see if it needs additional citations. They're going to tweet about it, update their Google Scholar profile, post about it on Facebook, send a PDF to the institution that hosts their research materials, email call colleagues who might be interested in this work, um, and then write a short, popular, or plain language account uh, for their institution. So there's a lot of things that you can do, and it's, I can attest it's really helpful to have this nice checklist of things and areas that I want to, what I want to disseminate and how I want to do that, um, so that I don't forget um, to do this, this very important thing. 
Um, and of course, uh, we can't really talk about dissemination without mentioning open access. Um, so open access publications are free to readers. And because of that, they generally receive higher visibility. Um, they will generate more citations because people can find and have access to the work. And they allow you as the author to retain some of your copyright. Um, if you would like to look up some open access journals, you can go to the directory of open access journals. Um, these journals in this directory must exercise peer review or editorial, editorial quality control. If you're further concerned, because I know there is this concept of predatory publishing going on in the open access sphere, um, you can also look to see whether or not the journal is part of the Open Access Scholarly Publisher Association, um, which has a screening process um, uh, using their code of conduct. Uh, again, for those maybe not super familiar with open access, um, there are two kind of types that I'm going to talk about today. One is gold open access. Um, this makes the final version of your article freely and permanently accessible for everyone immediately after publication. If you are looking at what is called a gold OA journal, um, you will generally notice that they do charge um, an article processing fee. Uh, to further confuse things, there's a kind of a subversion of gold OA journals called hybrid journals. Um, these are subscription-based journals where readers or libraries have to pay to access the content of the journal, but they'll offer you an open access option for your article if you pay an additional fee. So your article in the journal could be made openly available to readers, whereas the rest of the content um, that isn't open access would then be behind a paywall. So some examples of journals that um, are open access um, are the Journal of Physiotherapy, the Journal of Rehabilitation, Kinesiology, and others. This is not at all a complete list, but I just wanted to give some examples. Um, there is another version of open access uh, other than gold OA. There's something called green OA, which would be uploading your manuscript to a digital or institutional repository. You need to know a few things before you can look into this option. Um, and generally, if you're working with um, something that has already been published, you do need to know whether or not the journal allows for uploading to a digital repository. Um, if it's something that you aren't, it's not something you're going to publish in a formal journal. It's maybe a figure or an image that you're not publishing in a journal or something Something of that nature. Um, those things generally you get to decide uh, whether or not you want to upload it. Um, but if you're working with a journal, you really need to make sure that they um, allow it. Uh, you need to know what version can be uploaded, if there's any visibility uh, restrictions or an embargo that has to be used or for how long it needs to be embargoed and the type of license that must be applied. Um, if you're confused about this, it's really great to just go to your publisher's website or your journal's website and look for information regarding licenses and copyright, author's right, green archiving, author reuse, and other sorts of terms. Or you can use a resource called Sherpa Romeo, and this has publisher's copyright and archiving policies. So I'm going to show you a brief example of a record in Sherpa Romeo um, in case you're interested in using this tool. Um, this is a record for the journal called Topics in Stroke Rehabilitation. Um, it's just a record that I looked up uh, in Sherpa Romeo. Uh, and here it gives me some information. It tells me that the authors um, can archive a preprint uh, in an institutional repository. Um, this would be a preprint, uh, again, uh, is something that is uh, prior to being peer reviewed. Um, uh, but it, it is, in this case, it is in the journal, but it just it's the version that you haven't had peer reviewed yet. Um, you can also archive the postprint. So this is the version that is uh, done after peer review, but you cannot archive the publisher's version. That's the, the PDF that has the maybe the journal's branding and then the formatting that the journal provides for it. So you can't upload that one, but they are giving you options for other versions of the article. And then they have some general conditions. Um, you need you can uh, put the article on your personal website or your departmental website immediately. Um, if you're putting it into a digital repository, institutional repository, or subject-based repository, um, you do need to have a 12-month embargo. Um, you can't, again, can't use the publisher's version of the PDF. Um, and uh, you do need to um, make sure that you link to the published version um, and things like that. So this is just an example of some of the options that you have. Uh, and if you're curious, so I keep saying the word digital or institutional repository, what are these? Well, ask at your institution's library. Your institution may have one for you. 
Um, if they don't or you're not at an institution, um, you have some other options. So a really great one is Figshare. There's also Dryad and Zenodo. If you want more options, you can go to Open Door, which is a global directory of open access repositories. Again, this is a super um, great way to get your work disseminated out to various audiences. Make sure that people can have access and can see it and to really get your work out there. So I'm going to touch now on enhancing dissemination. Uh, you can enhance dissemination using social media, of course. That's a really great way uh, to make sure that the word gets out there, that people can see your work. Uh, there's lots of different platforms. You can certainly use ones that you feel comfortable with. Uh, but before you do that, you need to make sure you actually have content to share. Um, so if you're a little overwhelmed by that idea, um, some ideas here for you, um, or maybe you already have some content, like interesting quotes from your published literature, or presentation slides that you've already created about your research, it would be really easy to kind of put out there and make um, available to people. Um, there are other topics that you could consider uh, for content, like discussions about your research findings, or you could raise questions about an area of research. You could comment on publications by other authors to kind of engage them in a conversation. Um, you can recap conferences that you've attended. I, for one, I really enjoy that um, on Twitter, especially uh, for the conferences that I'm not able to attend to really see what other people are thinking about or talking about or sessions they went to. Um, you can write a description of how your re research can relate to public policy um, or connections of current events to your area of research, or you can write a plain language or popular language uh, uh, summary um, of your research so that you can have it available to you to share um, on these various platforms to really enhance the dissemination of your work. Now, um, that plain language or popular language summary is also called a lay summary. Um, a lay summary is a brief summary of re your research project that can be used to explain complex ideas and technical scientific terms to people who don't have prior knowledge. Um, and if that is overwhelming to you, just consider answering two questions. Uh, if you have a particular article, for instance, that you want to share, answer these questions in very short way. What is it about and why is it important? Um, and imagine that someone's asking you that so what question and whether you've answered that, you know, implied question. So um, just what is it about and why is it important in, in a really short format? And that will give you some content that you can really use on those social media platforms. Um, you want to make sure that you're using plain language, which is very clear communication so that your audience gets it the first time they hear it or read it. Um, and there are some good resources to help with that, the Plain Language Medical Dictionary um, from the University of Michigan and the PRISM Alternative Word List, um, which is another great resource um, for plain language. Uh, another thing you can do is make sure that you use graphics. So a lot of uh, these social media platforms, um, in order to really engage people, you might want to have some kind of visual summary or infographic or illustration um, that draws people in. Uh, so uh, one option is a graphical abstract, which is a concise pictorial and visual summary of the main findings of your research article. Uh, and there's lots of ways you can do this. Microsoft Publisher is a great tool for creating um, very easy easy um, little graphics or things related to your research. Uh, another fun one uh, is Canva, which is an online tool. Um, and I found in one company, I'm sure there are many others that will do this uh, for a fee for you. It's called Research Retold. Um, and why would you want to do this? Well, there was a study done by the Annals of Surgery um, that they looked at if they just did uh, the uh, tweets that just contained the title of the article versus tweets that had a visual abstract. They found that there was a lot more interaction with the research when there was a visual abstract present. Uh, and so uh, it's a really great kind of reminder that um, our users, especially on social media, love that visual content. So we're going to talk about some social media platforms. I'm not going to go too in detail about any of these. Um, I will tell you that a lot of the information I got for these slides came from a great resource called the Pew Research Center's Use of Different Online Platforms by Demographic Groups. Super informative about which users or audiences use various tools. Um, so for instance, we know Facebook has a huge user base. It's great for building public and private groups around theme topic, topics, um, encouraging you to use photos, uh, make sure you're replying to commenters, um, and apparently posting between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Monday through Friday um, is the best time, but Thursday is really the best from one to two. So apparently we're all kind of on Facebook on, on Thursday afternoon. Um, but it's a 
great uh, 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 tool to use. There's also Twitter. Um, it's a very popular social media network for connecting with other researchers and, around, and journalists. Um, and you can follow hashtags around various research interests. So it's a great resource. Um, if you're curious when your followers are most likely to be online, um, there's lots of tools, but we found one called Twitteroid that was kind of fun, um, that would really kind of help you understand when your users are most online so that you can be most impactful with your tweets. Uh, this is an example of, um, you can go find Michael Eisen. He posted a really fun tweet about some work that he had just posted in a preprint server called BioArchive. Um, and he just had this whole thread about how this research unfolded and what they thought was just amazing from this discovery. Um, and it was retweeted and liked a lot and, and noticed by a lot of audiences. Um, it, and uh, so this is a good example of okay, maybe how you can use Twitter um, in dissemination of your work. Of course, when you're working on Twitter, you want to make sure that you think about things like using Twitter handles and hashtags just to make the tweet a little more searchable and interactive. So make sure you're, if you know that your uh, fellow co-authors or the people that have contributed to whatever you're tweeting, um, make sure that you maybe have their Twitter handles and, and um, you can think of some good hashtags that make that tweet more searchable or findable when people are looking for that topic. Um, LinkedIn is another, you know, really great resource. Again, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but there are lots of options there. Pinterest is really great um, for uh, kind of connecting with um, using images and infographics and and because uh, those are really easy for people to pin um, into uh, particular um, boards. Um, and so it's a great, great tool for that sort of thing. Instagram, of course, we know very, very popular. YouTube. And then, of course, I couldn't uh, not mention blogs, podcasts, and videos. There's lots of platforms that you can use to do these. So I didn't mention anyone in particular. Um, but uh, I, the London School of Economics has a great impact blog that has some wonderful posts about academic blogging and academic podcasts. And then I also put a link to um, the University of Oxford podcast because I found that those are incredibly interesting. So if you want kind of a good example um, of, an, of a kind of a scholarly podcast, um, that's one group that you could go to to kind of get some ideas from. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that I am just going to touch on research impact in academia. So we do all of this dissemination, right? Because we want people to know about our work. We want them to use it or build on it or learn from it in some way. And in academia, the one way that we kind of identify whether or not that has happened is through these metrics. And, and generally it's like, oh, these metrics measure what we might call research impact. Um, of course, it's a very broad topic. And so these metrics are not the only way that you would measure the impact of your work, but they're, they're one way that you will see um, very clearly in being used in academia. Um, so things like uh, time cited. Um, so traditionally impact has been measured by citations among peer reviewed journals. So you might see th people saying things like, well, you know, my, my work is impactful because my paper has been cited 20 times or my H index is 24, which means 24 of my papers have been cited at least 24 times or my journals have metrics. So my average journal impact factor of the journals that I published in is 8.17 or something like that. And um, I want to just caution that um, these metrics are not normalized in any way. And so um, if you're kind of all of our field, all the fields that we work in all have different publishing practices, different lengths of time between when they publish. There's even subfields. There's, you know, more of the basic sciences that have different publishing practices versus more of the clinical uh, science. So so we have to think that, you know, you can't really, um, you know, if you're going up for promotion and tenure and you're talking about the number of times your paper has been cited, you know, that committee has people from all different fields and that might not really resonate well with them. They might not quite understand what that means for your field. Um, and so in a way, when you're using those metrics, you're, you're making people compare apples to oranges because they're trying to compare your field with theirs and they're not really maybe understanding um, the, the, what that really means. So I would um, encourage you to focus on more normalized citation metrics. So um, things like percentile rankings and journal quartiles, which really normalize the fields so that you can say things like more than 80% of my papers are in the 90th percentile based on citation impact. I mean, that 
I, you can compare against other fields or um, looking at quartiles in journals. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into these normalized metrics, but if you do have further questions, there's a wonderful tool called the Metrics Toolkit, which really helps you understand what a metric means, how it's calculated, and if it's a good match for your impact question. Um, and I will say that I am an editor on this toolkit, uh, but it is a really great open, uh, openly available source um, for inf information about metrics. So uh, that is kind of my presentation for today. I have uh, lots of people to thank uh, for the materials that they've created that I've used um, and built upon. Um, and uh, please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I am now going to turn it over to Patty Smith from Altmetric. Thank you. All right, let me pull up my slides here and enter in my full screen. Okay, looks like you should all be able to see my screen there. All right, thank you to Allison and Karen um, for her great presentation. So my name is Patty Smith and I'm the Senior Engagement Manager at Altmetric. And so I'm going to take us into the second portion of our talk today. So Karen showed you some great tips on how to disseminate your work. So now we'll talk more about how you can further inform your dissemination strategy and then track the attention that your work is receiving beyond just those citation counts. Uh, so this section will be all about Altmetrics or alternative metrics. And if you're totally new to this concept, no worries, we're definitely going to start with the basics. But kind of before digging into those basics, I do want to stop and take a moment to talk about some terminology that I frequently used so everyone is all on the same page. Uh, so an output or a research output, when I talk about this, this is simply an individual research product. It's usually going to be a, a journal article or a book, but we do track all sorts of different research products such as data sets, images, slide decks, visual abstracts, uh, the list really goes on. So it, it's usually going to be a paper, a journal article that I'm talking about, um, but I do try and use the, the term research output. Um, a source or an attention source, this is the place where research is being shared online. So it could be a social media site like Twitter, a news outlet, a blog, could be Wikipedia. Um, so that is the online source of the attention. And then an, a mention or an altmetric mention, this is the actual share, reference to, or engagement with that research output. So the source might be Twitter, but the actual mention is someone tweeting about your work. Okay, so Karen uh, touched on this a little bit, this big question of what is research impact, but kind of to just hammer this point home a little bit, I'll go over a couple things, starting with what research impact is not. Um, so research impact is not publishing in a particular journal. It is not a high impact factor. It's not being cited or your paper being downloaded or tweeted about. These are all metrics that can help you to tell your broader science story, but they are not research impact in and of themselves. And I'm fully aware that, you know, your department head or your promotion and tenure committee may have very specific definitions of what impact means to them. And that can include providing, you know, your H index to that P&T committee, for example. Um, so I do understand that, that you do have those set definitions. Uh, but the greater research community is really favoring this definition that impact is the tangible change and benefit to society beyond academia. So it's a change in policy, culture, the environment, the economy, um, which can be really difficult to demonstrate. And to kind of supplement that parsed down definition on the previous slide, I, I did want to include some excerpts from more formalized definitions like the Research Excellence Framework in the UK. So you can have these at your disposal when we disseminate the slides later on if you want to dig more into these definitions and examples of what research impact is. Okay, so how do altmetrics or alternative metrics kind of fit into this research impact conversation? Um, so Karen had a really great timeline uh, that she started off with. And in the early 2010s, there was this call to action from the scientific community to start tracking these interactions with research publications beyond just citations and how academics cite each other. Because research affects many people, but most people and stakeholders don't actually publish research or do research themselves, or research might not be their main focus of their role. And I think a good example of this are clinical practitioners. So most nurses, physicians, therapists, other clinical staff who care for patients day in and day out aren't doing 
doing research, um, or like I said, research is not their main focus, but their clinical decisions are definitely impacted by research and they need to stay on top of things. And so they're having these online conversations, sharing and talking about research and alt Altmetrics t attempt to uncover who these people are and, and where they're discussing research online beyond that academic bubble. And so companies like Altmetric were launched to track this valuable information to give us those metrics beyond just citations. So here is a more formal definition of altmetrics. So these are indicators of non-traditional attention and engagement with digitally published research and scholarship. And they're non-traditional because we view those citation-based metrics as more of the traditional indicator um, of, of that engagement. But I do realize this is kind of a, a verbose, uh, hard to remember definition. So I usually explain altmetrics as, you know, we're tracking conversations about research online. So how research is shared on Twitter, in the news, on Wikipedia, in policy documents, the list goes on. But to kind of dig into that definition a little bit more, so altmetrics, it does stand for alternative metrics. So these are data that explain both the volume and the nature of the attention that research has received online. And we can measure how many people have shared or engaged with that output and where that's happening, and then providing us evidence of engagement with those diverse audiences at potential downstream impact beyond academia. And I do want to note that these metrics are complementary to citation-based bibliometrics, so we're not trying to replace the H-index or the journal impact factor. Instead, we want people to use all these metrics together to tell a more complete story about, uh, about their potential research impact. And one big piece and strength of altmetrics is the time factor. Altmetrics offer you immediate feedback about the attention that work, your work is receiving in real time. Um, and so citations are notoriously slow to accrue. It can take two to five years depending on the discipline. Um, whereas altmetrics, like I said, offer you that immediate feedback. Um, so you can publish a paper today and already you'll start to see tweets and news outlets um, picking up newly published research. And I think that's really great for early career researchers um, to have that real time feedback. So they have some sort of metrics to demonstrate the potential impact that their work is having. Also really great for um, uh, you know, progress reports for grants or, or new uh, applications for funding because you have some, um, some of that more, uh, more immediate feedback about recently published work. So here is a, I think, a really nice visualization of part of the life cycle of a research output and how and when attention happens in that digital environment. So we can see the horizontal axis is time and the vertical axis is the volume of attention. So like I said, within hours of research being published, people start to pick, pick it up on Twitter, see tweets about it, news outlets talking about that new work. Uh, and as the days go by, people have time to really digest that, that research. We see blog posts and other commentary appearing, um, maybe those lay summaries being written, like Karen mentioned, Wikipedia articles being updated with new citations and it's generally not until months or years down the line where we start to see those scholarly citations start to appear and there are a lot fewer citations compared to some of these other types of attention which is due to the fact that it's generally only other academics who are citing research whereas other types of engagement engagement are open to potentially anyone to participate in okay so so far i've been mostly talking about alternative metrics or alt metrics in general but now I'm going to kind of shift a bit and talk about how you can discover and leverage altmetrics by using tools and data that we do provide at altmetric. And you may have noticed uh, throughout my slides this colorful circle appearing on the slide deck. Uh, this is our altmetric logo and our visualization that you may have seen before. So many publishers embed altmetric data in different ways. So on the screen, you see three different versions of how altmetric badges uh, are embedded on journal web pages. So see in the upper left, uh, the JAMA network uh, has our, our data, but they don't have anything colorful. They just have altmetric and you can click on that link. The one on the right advances rheumatology. We have a very prominently featured um, colorful circle where you can see the trending articles and then another example from neurology there. So you may have seen this before, um, but if you click on any of those, those links, any of those altmetric badges, you're going to see something that looks like this. This is an altmetric details page, or you can actually view the ways people are talking about this particular paper online. So I'll show you a live demo of one of these details pages in just a bit. But first, I, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what the visualization and what the score means. And so we lovingly refer to this colorful circle, or, or I've heard it, that, that whirly thing that you guys have. Um, we refer to this circle as our altmetric donut. Um, and the donut is comprised of different colors that represent different types of attention. So we have 17 categories of attention tracking thousands of websites online. So based on the colors uh, of your donut, you can tell at a glance what types of attention your paper has received. So purple um, indicates policy document mentions, red is new so on and so forth. And so if you have a circle that is completely light blue, you know right away at a glance that that research output only has Twitter attention, for example. 
but what about the altmetric attention score? Um, so put simply, the score is an indicator of the volume of attention an output has received. Uh, so on this screen here, you see this paper has a score of 1,254. That does not mean that 1,254 individual people have shared this particular output. Uh, it is a weighted score. So on the right, you can see kind of a preview of how that, that weighting breaks down. So if this research is mentioned in the news, that is going to receive more weight towards the score than if it's tweeted about or if it's, it's posted on Facebook. Um, but it is important to remember that the attention score, it really is just an indicator of the volume of the attention. Just because an output has a high score, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is um, a good impactful paper. And on the flip side, if something has a low score, that doesn't mean you can write off that attention and say, oh, that didn't get much good attention. Um, instead, we want to favor looking at the context. So always remember that context is key. So in order to assess how that research is actually being used or if it's making a difference, we have to look at what people are saying and not just rely on those numbers um, because uh, or what the good news is with Altmetric, you know, we can actually follow those breadcrumbs to find that evidence of how people are talking about it. Um, and I like to use this example here of this particular paper that has, um, looking at citation counts, it's been cited over 1,500 times, looking at a more normalized metric, the relative citation ratio, it has an, an RCR of 31. Um, so that's very, very highly cited paper. So looking at those traditional metrics and looking at the Altmetrics, it has a very high Altmetric attention score of over 3,300. It's been featured or mentioned in hundreds of news outlets. It's even been cited in policy documents and patents. Um, so my gut would be, oh, this must be a really impactful um, practice changing paper. But um, in fact, this is the infamous Lancet paper that was retracted linking vaccines and autism. Um, so I think this is a really great example of how you can't just rely on those numbers and you actually have to see how people um, how, how people are, are mentioning this work. And it's actually very interesting. A lot of retracted papers ha are very highly cited and have a lot of altmetric attention. Um, so we can't rely on just those high numbers. We can look at those numbers, look at that quantitative to tell us where we might want to dig a little bit further uh, to discover the, that qualitative information and discover those treasures of how people are talking about our work. Okay, so how can you go about tracking the attention your research is receiving online? So of course you can view Altmetric Donuts, um, the badges that are embedded in different journal pages, um, but your access to data or data does not stop there. You can also check with your institution to see if you have access to the Altmetric Explorer database. So this is our flagship product. Um, this is gonna be the the, the most, uh, most data you can get is gonna be from our, our database. So definitely check with your research office or with your library if you have a library at your institution or organization to see if you do have access to Altmetric. Explorer. Um, we also have badges for researchers, so you can embed these, these donuts badges onto your website or onto your CV for free. Um, we also have the API that you can use for research purposes, that's free as well. And we have the free Altmetric bookmarklet, um, which I definitely encourage you to install in your bookmarks bar if you have not already done so. You can just Google Altmetric bookmarklet and it's a very easy process to drag and drop um, that bookmark bookmarklet into your bookmarks toolbar, so then you can very easily check and see if different papers um, have, uh, have Altmetric attention. Um, so again, yeah, that's free. So con consider consider taking a look at that. So now I'll take a look at an example of an altmetric details page, so we can keep, see what kind of information we can gather. Oopsies. Let's go back there. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's let that load. Um, all right, so this is what a, an altmetric details page might look like for you. Um, so we have up here the title uh, of that research output, and in the summary tab, we have some of the metadata associated with this particular paper. On the left side of the screen, we see, of course, our, our donut, and this has a very colorful donut, so at a glance, I can tell that a lot of different sources of attention have mentioned this, and it does have a high altmetric attention score, so I'm looking at uh, high volumes here. So looking down here on the left, the, the mentioned by area, uh, 69 news outlets, six blogs, one policy source, so on and so forth. Um, scrolling down a little bit. We do provide citation information for you. So this has been cited 26 times um, according to the Dimensions database. And so we provide that link for you there. And we also are tracking readers on Mendeley. So people who are saving this paper to their Mendeley account um, to, to revisit or read later, we provide those numbers for you as well. But the citations and readers, um, these are not taken into consideration with the altmetric attention score or the donut. Um, they're just provided there as a convenience for you. 
So you'll see over here in the middle section, we do have some heat maps for Twitter and Mendeley readers as well. So we can see kind of where in the world people are tweeting about um, this particular paper. And we can hover over any of these countries to kind of see the breakdown in those numbers. And you'll see some additional breakdown information down here at the bottom. Going back up to the top, um, so we have some buttons over here on the right. So we have Explore Further, and then way up at the top, we have Access Altmetric Explorer. So if you do have access to the full Altmetric Explorer database, and if you click on these buttons, you'll be taken into that or you'll be prompted to log in. So um, unfortunately, not everyone will have access to that, but um, you can click on that to see if you do have access to the full database. Uh, we can go back to the publisher's site if we want to view, view the full abstract on the publisher's website. Uh, and we can also alert ourselves about new mentions. So let's say that I'm an author on this paper and I just published it and I really want to know when people are talking about my work online, I can set up this alert for new mentions. So I can just put in my email and click start notifying me. And whenever this this, this paper is mentioned online, um, I'll, I'll get that notification so I can really stay on top of my dissemination strategy. Uh, so looking up here at the top, we have tons of tabs. So these are all our different sources of attention here. Uh, and this is where we can see how people are actually uh, uh, mentioning our work online. So if I go to the news tab, I'll see all these different news sources um, who are, are citing my work in that, that news article. So if I wanted to check out this Guardian, um, Guardian article and see how they're citing my work, I can just click on that. And I'll be taken directly to that news source so I can see. Um, so we can explore all these different news sources that are mentioning this paper. We can look at our, the blogs that are mentioning this work. Uh, policy documents. So this is a really, um, really popular fe feature that people like to see as we actually can see, let's see, we have two different, um, two different policy documents from the UK Parliament briefing notes. So the UK Parliament is citing my work. So I can actually go into here to view the full text PDF of this policy document to see how it's being cited. And of course, Twitter, uh, we can see all the tweets about this paper and I can hover over any of these to see how many followers this particular person has, the actual tweet of what they're saying, and I can reply or retweet or favorite um, directly within this interface. So we can see this one has a lot of Twitter attention. Um, so you kind of get the idea up here at the top, all these tabs is where we, we can actually explore the attention this paper is getting and what people are saying. Uh, going back to the summary tab here, uh, so I mentioned that we do have these kind of heat maps here, um, uh, these tabs that are kind of hidden a little bit, but I do want to call your attention over here to the attention score in context, because sometimes people don't see this, this little tab here. So of course, uh, I always like to favor looking at what people are saying instead of just focusing on the score. But the reality is, is that a lot of times people, people just want to know what the score means. And so if you are curious about that, we can take a look at this attention score in context tab. So I click on that, my screen will change a little bit. And we have, um, we've put this, the score into context in four different ways for you. So this first one, the defaults, um, this one I tend to tell people, eh, maybe stay away from this one. Uh, why do I say that? Is because this is comparing this particular um, paper to all of the research outputs that we're tracking at Altmetric. We're tracking over 14 million research outputs. So yeah, how much context are you really getting out of that when we're comparing at a, looking at a body of 14 million? So it doesn't provide much context for you. So instead, I, uh, I encourage people to look at these other tabs. So for example, looking at this one, uh, now this paper is being compared to outputs only from BMC Psychology. So we're tracking 338 outputs with altmetric attention from this particular journal. Uh, and this is the number one output. So it has the highest altmetric attention score uh, from this particular journal. So we put a little bit of narrative down here of how many outputs we're tracking, uh, the mean altmetric attention score from this journal. And you know this one is obviously in the top 1%. It's the number one paper. We can also look at outputs from a similar age, uh, so published on six weeks on either either side of this paper and then we can also look at outputs of a similar age from this journal so um, that's the attention scoring context if you want to take a look a look at that a little bit more so let me get back into my uh, my slides here it's like they're taking a second to load Okay, uh, so you may be asking, all right, well, so now I know how to find altmetric attention. I kind of know what altmetric attention is. What do I actually 
do with that information? What do I do with altmetric data? Um, so in many instances, like for grant applications or renewals or during the promotion and tenure process, researchers must think about creating a coherent narrative to explain um, their relationship between their research and potential downstream impact. But I have found that a lot of researchers have a tough time putting the impact of their work into words and, and describing that, um, that broader impact of their work. And I think this is true for using both bibliometrics or citation-based metrics and alternative metrics. So I'm going to walk through some examples of what this could possibly look like. So uh, once you gather data using either the altmetric bookmarklet or the explorer database, if you have access to it, to start building the context around the real world uses of your work, um, we can start to form that narrative. And I, I tend to tell people, consider investigating any policy mentions, mass media mentions, patent mentions, and social media attention that your work is getting um, first. So let's take a look at this paper um, on surgery for the treatment of epilepsy. So if I look at this paper's altmetric details page, I can see that it has a score of, of 24. Um, and so 24, um, may not be a super high score in your opinion, uh, but just remember that just because something has a lower score, it doesn't have a score of like a thousand, doesn't mean it doesn't have very, very um, impactful attention um, like this particular paper does. So at a glance, looking at this donut, I see purple, I see orange, and purple uh, in the, the color of the donut, that indicates that this has policy mentions and an orange indicates that it has patent mentions. So I already know right away that I'm gonna see that when I go into the details page. Um, so if I take a look at the patents tab, up at the top there, I'll see that this research, research informed numerous patent um, applications, which I can then click through and view additional information um, in our in the Dimensions database, which is one of our sister products. So I can see the, the patent application abstract, I can see the references, I can see the adventure, and if you have access to the Dimensions database, you can actually see the full text information um, of that particular patent um, to create that context. I can also dive deeper into the policy mentions, so I can see that this paper informed documents published by the World Health Organization, the CDC, the National Academies Press, and um, the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network. And again, I can click through to view the full text PDFs of these documents to see exactly how my paper um, is, is making a difference. So by looking into the context of this research and how it was actually used in these guidelines and documents, I discover that the, the patent mentions and the policy document mentions all point to this article as providing foundational knowledge uh, accepted best practice um, in the surgical treatment of epilepsy. So how do I actually put that into words? Uh, so here's one example of how we could form a narrative about this research impact. So this work has established, uh, has been established as foundational knowledge regarding best practices for surgical treatment of temporal, temporal lobe epilepsy as evidenced by citations in four international policy documents, including the World Health Organization and citations in patent applications to expand treatment options using Botox treatments. So um, that's one way you could do that, perhaps in an NIH biosketch or, or maybe in your promotion and tenure dossier. But I realize you don't always have that much room uh, to talk about um, talk about one single paper. Uh, so if I wanted to provide uh, all metric information, perhaps in, in my CV or in my supporting references of a, a grant application, but I don't have that much space to write a narrative about it, I could consider adding metrics to the end of my references. So I know I've seen people do this. So for example, the first one on the screen here lists the RCR or the relative citation ratio, which is a normalized metric. Um, so that kind of Karen talked about how you want to favor using normalized metrics and things like this. And I also see that this was cited in 23 public Public Health England norovirus reports. So, um, and then at the end, I see uh, where I got uh, this information. So it's always best practice to list where you found different metrics. So in this case, I got the relative citation ratio or the RCR from, di from dimensions, and I got that uh, Public Health England uh, information from Altmetric. So if you're getting your, your citation counts from Google Scholar, for example, it's always a good idea to list that that's where you actually got them. So here are some examples of how you could incorporate some different metrics, just tacking them onto the end of your, your reference list. Um, if you're trying to summarize your entire body of work or perhaps the work of your department, for example, you could put together uh, some highlights in something like this, like in a bulleted list. Um, and of course, I always like to try and pull out specific examples to provide that context. But in reality, uh, a lot of times it does come down to providing some high level sum summary numbers and we don't have that space to go into those specific examples. Um, but I think that brings up another point is that you'll notice that in all of these examples I've gone through, I never said my paper has an altmetric attention score of 24 uh, because no one's really going to know what that means uh, since the score is just an indicator of the volume of attention. So instead I favored saying things like 
oh, my paper was cited in four policy documents, including by the CDC, or my paper was mentioned in over 4,100 tweets in 76 countries. Uh, so definitely, I would say, if you're going to use metrics in, in something like this, don't just say, oh, I have this altmetric attention score, and, and try and provide a little bit more context about what that score actually means. Um, so yeah, just, just one, one, one suggestion there. Um, so you might be thinking, well, my promotion and tenure committee doesn't require me to provide them with these metrics, or my manager doesn't even know what all metrics are. Um, and that's probably true. And when, when we originally presented a shortened version of this talk uh, at the ACRM conference in November, we presented with Trudy Mallinson, who's a faculty member at George Washington University. And she gave some really great advice, which I've heard echoed by others as well. And that is to take control of your own narrative and how you present the impact of your work. And you can do that by using the metrics that you have at your disposal. Um, because while some university P&T committees and some funders do like to see alt metrics and, and they know what these alt metrics are, by and large, it's not a requirement, but that doesn't mean that you can't use them to tell your own story backed up by data to drive the direction of those conversations. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, if we have any questions, Karen and I are happy to field those questions. Um, if not, we're always available for, for follow-up um, later on after we end today. That was awesome. Thank you so much, um, Patty and Karen. Um, I definitely learned a lot and I feel like I have a lot more um, work to do to investigate all these great resources that you shared. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Karen always provides really great information in her slides and I'm always scribbling down things and she has a lot of great resources to, to visit later on. Yes, yeah, same here for you, Patty. <laughs> and I've been live tweeting your oh. webinar. <laughs> um, oh, wonderful! Thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, hopefully, people will will who weren't able to to join us during the webinar itself were, will um, will be able to go find it online. Um, so, I do want to thank you both again for sharing your expertise and your knowledge and all of these wonderful resources. Um, I am going to just very quickly um, share. Um, that, you know, we welcome everyone to join us in the Early Career Networking Group um, and, and follow us online and you can connect with us on the ACRM community page, on, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're everywhere. Um, so you can connect with us there. Um, we will have this webinar posted online on our community page within 48 hours. So. Um, you can access the recording and the slides there uh, in the future, and please share that widely. Um, we welcome you to join us in ACRM at the uh, ACM, ACRM Training Institute in Atlanta during our spring meeting in April. And again, we'll be back in Atlanta in October um, for our annual meeting. So um, with that, I will conclude this webinar, and thanks so much for being part of it. Thank you. Thanks.